So for my final trades going into round four, I ended up going Campbell Chesser and Tom Powell to Josh Kelly and Jacob Van Royen. I'd spoken in earlier videos about I wanted to bring in Clayton Oliver, and I think that was the right decision. Uh, he went and scored 128 against the Eagles, which potentially could have been a bad matchup for him flying over to WA. But I think now he's shown that he's almost unstoppable, and I'm more and more confident that he's going to be a 120 average for the season, and you just have to get on when you can. I don't think I'll be able to get him in this week, but he's definitely a guy that I'm looking to bring in as soon as possible. The reason I went to Josh Kelly was Campbell Chesser was named as an out with injury, and to get up to Oliver, I would have had to trade out uh, Philippou. Uh, I didn't want to do that with Chesser not named. I don't want any rookies on my bench that aren't playing, except at the moment I've got a non-playing R3, which most people would have, but Chesser injured, he had to go. He wasn't really generating cash anyway, he's just clogging up a spot. So essentially, he goes to Van Roy, and I still had some extra cash and was able to bring in Josh Kelly. Those were my trades for the week. Uh, as a result of those trades, I ended up scoring 2,059, a uh, round ranking around 5,500, and it brought my overall ranking in inside the top 10,000. So I'm happy with that, heading in the right direction. And my team value is 18.13 million, which is well, reasonably good. The top team values at the moment are about 18.4 million. So I'm heading in the right direction with value. I've just got to keep building my team and hopefully just chip away at that lead. Not confident at a top 100 finish because just because my start was so poor, um, I missed out on like guys like Green, Setterfield that were pretty obvious picks uh, and I just wasn't brave enough to pick them and went with boring, bad selections that didn't have any good principles behind them in Crips and Hewitt, that guys didn't really have value and they weren't necessarily top eight mids either. Uh, so those those bad selections to start the year have put me behind, but now it's just a, uh, whether I can catch up just making good long-term decisions and see how far into that, you know, top 10,000, top 1,000 I can get. Looking at the team overall, uh, Doherty, 74, a little bit disappointing. A lot of people fell for like a captaincy. I shouldn't say four for him. It, it looked like a decent option with what the Hawks did to them, but you've just got to be careful um, at Marvel. It's quite a small ground, so sometimes if teams are playing pretty good high-pressure game, there's not as much room for that chip-around style, whereas on the MCG, uh, it's a lot harder to lock down all of those defensive outlets. So that's potentially a reason why he didn't score as well. And... You know, the, the really smart coaches, they don't tend to let uh, good players sort of run around and do what they please. They put a little bit of planning into everyone and try and stop the opposition's best weapons. Dacos, sensational pick. He's locked in. Um, then I get to McGrath and Ridley, who are two guys that are performing at a similar level and have both been pretty disappointing. I picked them because I was hoping the Essendon backline would chip the ball around a little bit. We've seen that a little bit, but the spread's just been too great. There hasn't really been any one guy who I'd hoped had been would be McGrath um, running around getting lots of marks around the back line. So I think McGrath's going to be the one to go this week. He's actually averaging below his price, which is completely unacceptable for someone that's neither a rookie nor a keeper. He's right in that awkward mid-price position, and because of that and because he's averaging underneath his price point, he's going to have to go. Ridley, similar. He's not exceptional, but he's just doing a little bit better than McGrath at a little bit cheaper um, and has a lower break even this week. Will Day, another huge game from him. He's been fantastic. He's actually been winning a lot more inside footy and clearances than I was expecting with his light frame. I thought maybe he'd run around on the MCG. This game was against Geelong, collecting lots of marks on the outside, but he's actually been really strong on the inside and laying tackles. Um, potentially suspension worry for him, but I don't think it was actually a slinging action. I think it was a natural tackling action and the player just happened to hit his head on the ground. So I think he should be fine. And then Jimby, quieter game, but he's still averaging 70, really good tackler. And they were sort of wiped off the field by Melbourne in that game. So I, w I would be expecting him to bounce back and you don't really have many better options in the back line. But, you know, if, if he's running out of steam, then maybe we'll have to look at options for him. Dunkley continues to be pretty disappointing, but with the forward status, you just hold on and hope he comes good. Playing in a new team will take a little bit more time to build continuity. Tom Green continues to play really, really well. He's a great pick for the year. Same uh, same with Will Setterfield. Fantastic score build from Centerfield with marks and tackles. Warple and Callahan, two guys that everyone was sort of considering trading out, held the faith. Um, with guys like this, You've just got to look at what they're averaging and what they're priced at. And I think it's very important to keep your expectations um, sort of where they should be given the player's price. Like, 
if guys are averaging 60, it might be an issue if you're if you paid top dollar for them, but if they're averaging 60 and they're only priced at 50, then that's fine. And you're going to have more pressing issues in your team, like rookies that aren't playing or guys that are actually going down in value as mid prices that you need to get off of. But uh, both of them, Callahan in particular was impressive and Warple, he's just hanging on at the moment. Hopefully he can just keep chipping away, gaining a little bit more price and holding on as a reliable, you know, 70 average in the midfield. And then he can be moved up once some of these rookies have, have maxed out in price. Kelly, I brought in and put the captain on him, um, got 106, which was good. He was tracking a little bit better than that at the start of the game, but I'm just glad that I got 100 from my captain when a few people had bad captaincy scores from like Doherty and Laird, uh, stuff like that. Ashcroft, everyone's got him. Uh, he'll continue to churn. McKenzie, similar. Although, you know, Hawthorne, if they're, if they're continuing to be pretty uncompetitive, they're going to have some issues. But for the first half of that game, they were really good. They'll be inconsistent, and you just got to hope that they can keep it together enough that these young midfielders can continue to score. English, another huge game. He's everywhere at the moment, playing a lot like Brody Grundy used to do, except he's a better mark than Grundy. Probably not quite as strong in the contest, but um, fantastic, like at ground level in the contest, but he's just awesome around the ground and continues to get marks from kick-ins, which fantasy gold, but I mentioned before, don't understand how it helps the Bulldogs that much. He should be getting further down the line. Anyway, that's not that important. And Ron Marshall was up against a Gold Coast Suns team that didn't have Jared Witts. He was laid out. Ned Moyle came into the ruck. So Marshall scored 107 in basically three quarters of the game because he was subbed out in the last quarter. But uh, again, he's probably going to be the second highest averaging ruckman in fantasy. And then the forward line, Taranto, consistent, lock him in as a top forward, awesome. Um, Rosie has been a little bit disappointing, but uh, there's not that many other options. Maybe, you know, a Cornelio or uh, Goulden, but uh, it's not worth the trade at the moment. He's still averaging what's he averaging 90 which is fantastic for a forward that's top six forward worthy and Zeeble um, playing halfback for the Kangaroos having him and Sheasel is fantastic because one of those two is going to be getting the ball in the Kangaroos defensive half so even if one has a down game it's probably going to be because the other guy played so much better Horn Francis he's the other guy that is underperforming a little bit um, what I am buoyed by is he's he's actually impacting games even though he's getting lower numbers um but uh, I'm not sure whether he's he's going to be having that ceiling or really being able to push on like, say, Nick Dacos has. He, like, he doesn't play with the intensity that Nick Dacos does. He is a little bit of a jogger, um, doesn't really want to chase and get involved, and is basically scoring purely on natural talent and his strength in the contest and being able to take a few contested marks as well. So he's one that I'll be looking to move on soon. The, the decision-making between him and McGrath is... Horn Francis is still averaging above his price, and from his price, I wouldn't really be able to get anyone good in. And at this point in the year, you really, for me, I don't really want to be bringing in mid prices unless there's a really obvious opportunity, like a Darcy Cameron last year, where there's an injury that opens up a new role for someone. But other than that, I just want to be bringing in top guys in their line. And the decision is from Horn Francis, I could get to Golden. Um, who is a good player and I think is, is very close top of his line. But for McGrath, I can get up to Jordan Dawson, who I think will average over 100. He's playing more midfield time for the Crows. And he's just a guy that I, I can trust a little bit more. Whereas Goulden, I think they've got a little bit more of this tough run that he's heading into um, and potentially could stagnate a little bit with his price. I just want to have a little bit more of a look at him as well because it looks like their centre bounces are moving more towards Mills, Parker, Rowbottom and Warner and maybe Goulden's getting pushed out a little bit. So since I didn't start him, I don't want to jump on now having already missed the good scores and then jump on him for poor scores. That's the rationale behind that. Other than that... Um, I'm reasonably happy with my team. I did a little bit of math on it. And basically, after round four, before any of these next batch of trades, my team's average overall, what all of the players averaging, combines to be 2,185. And the team in first place currently is 2,212. So my team's only, you know, 30 points behind. And that's with the first place team having Oliver with the captaincy on Oliver each week. That's what his average would be, um, 22.12, and mine's only 21.85. So I'm not, I'm not that far behind on average per week. It's just that I've missed a little bit of a head start not starting with 
these good mid prices and I've had to bring them in and use my trades bringing them in. On the plus side, though, I think my rookies are stronger than most of the other teams up the top end. I've seen a few guys with non-playing rookies that they've held, which is I think is really bad practice, and other just not not the best rookies in their position. So that's where I'm going to try and stay on top. Like even I'm looking at Fergus Green, he could go bring in someone like a Bailey Humphrey who's going to score a little bit better, um, and j- try and really stay on top and make sure that my team continues to generate cash because having had that poor start, I'm going to have to work really hard and catch up and if I do get a good finish it'll only be right at the end of the year after building some really serious team value and um, catching up late that's how it's all sitting at the moment um, I'll see you later in the week for the trades podcast uh, video